Hi, my name is Gustavo Silva and I'm assistant professor of biology here at Duke University. And in this video, we're going to talk about protein diversity, how the structure and function of protein can control life as we know it. And we all know that our body is composed of trillions of trillions of tiny little cells that has a ton of molecules inside of it. But have you ever thought about how each one of the functions of our body can be controlled at the molecular level? Have you ever thought that very similar processes or very important processes like walking and talking or even promoting respiration or digestion can be controlled by tiny little molecules? So something very, very interesting in biology is that all those functions can be controlled by protein or many of the functions that we know and are important can be controlled by proteins. So when we think about walking, you have specific motor proteins that can slide over each other and make your body move. In the process of respiration, you have a very unique protein called hemoglobin inside our red blood cells that binds oxygen from the air and drives them to specific tissues in the process of making energy. So to participate in each one of those processes, you already can imagine that you need thousands of different proteins to do each one of those functions. So if it's a motor protein, a protein that allows you to make moves, they need to have a certain shape and form so they can actually perform that function. In terms of respiration, in the protein that is able to accommodate an oxygen molecule and drive them to tissues. So each one of those proteins, they have to have something very unique, a certain shape, what we call a 3D structure that allows them to perform each one of those functions. So I think it's easier now to understand that our body does a lot of different functions that they might need a lot of unique proteins, but where do these proteins come from, right? So some of you might be saying, yeah, it comes from our diet, so we're eating proteins all the time, we're always talking about this food or that food that is rich in proteins. But can you use the protein that you just ingested from your diet? Can you use it the way that it is? And the answer is actually no. Right? So if you think about a plant or if you think about an animal, that protein was not just a source of food. It had a function in that organism. Right? So what we, it's really important here to know is that our body would process those proteins into small little pieces. So every time you eat something that is rich in proteins, your body is able to process and chop them into small building blocks that then your cells are able to uptake to create the proteins that you need. And what is really interesting is that in nature, all living organisms use the same building blocks, and that's what we call amino acids. So we have 20 different types of building blocks that is the same if you think about a plant, or if you think of bacteria, or if you think about us, is the same type of building blocks that are used to make and create those proteins. So every time you eat something that is rich in proteins, our body is gonna process into the small building blocks, so then we can uptake them and then assemble our own proteins. So then the question is, how do we know how to put a protein together? What's the right order? So the answer is in your DNA. So your DNA has all the information that allows your cells to make thousands and thousands of unique proteins. So when we think about our DNA, and this is our genetic material, it has a certain language because the DNA has also its own building blocks, which is called nucleotides. So we have four types of nucleotides that compose the DNA. In the DNA, you have this recipe to promote it and produce each one of those unique proteins. But you cannot just take from DNA and make protein. So in this process, your cells are gonna make a copy of that DNA into a molecule that is called RNA. So it's a different type of molecule, but it uses still the same building blocks or similar nucleotides to make RNA, but it's kind of like making a copy of a page of that book and then take it to your kitchen so you can assemble all those ingredients together. So that copy is called messenger RNA, and this process is called transcription. So during transcription, you're making a copy of that recipe for a given protein, and that's what cells are gonna use to then make the protein. And to make that protein, you use, there is a, a molecular complex inside our cells called ribosomes. And the ribosomes are gonna be able to read that RNA or that messenger RNA, and then start putting those building blocks together. And this process is called translation. So the name comes from because you're using a different alphabet now that goes from nucleotides, and that's what you had in DNA and RNA, to now amino acids, so different building blocks to make each one of those unique molecules. So the RNA is gonna be a copy for one single protein, you're gonna have the recipe, and then the ribosome is this molecular machine that is gonna be able to assemble each one of those amino acids in the right order. So we've been talking about how the information can travel from the mRNA to then make a protein, but we still haven't talked about how proteins can achieve its final structure and then its final function. 
So something that is really important to know is that between those 20 different amino acids, you have four main groups, right? Between those four main groups, one of them is what we call hydrophilic. Those are the ones that interact well with water. And you have another one that are called hydrophobic. So those do not interact well with water. Between those two groups, the hydrophilic wants to be close to each other and the hydrophobic wants to be close to each other. The other two classes, those are based on electrical charges. So you have amino acids that can be positively charged and amino acids that can be negatively charged. And in this case, if you have positively charged amino acids, they don't like to be close to each other, so they usually repel each other. At the same time, they are attracted to amino acids that have a negative charge. So in this case of this protein that we assemble here, that you have each one of those beads representing a unique amino acid, we know that they are not just beads on a string, they're not just a linear protein, they actually have a 3D structure that allows them to perform a certain function. But how this 3D structure is achieved? So now knowing that, for example, you have hydrophobic amino acids in this structure, they want to be close together, so that protein will start to fold in on itself. But as they do this, you can bring other amino acids that don't want to be close to each other, like those two red ones here with the red ones on top. So then the protein starts folding in a different direction. And as you can see here, now it brings the yellow close to each other, and this can go away from the other group of yellow. And eventually the protein will achieve its final 3D structure that allows them to perform unique functions. So now we know that the human DNA encodes the information to make about 20 to 25,000 different proteins. So all of those have unique features as they have unique length, but also unique sequences. And now we know that the information coming from DNA being converted into mRNA and then into protein, this is what we call the central dogma of molecular biology. And all this information encoded in your DNA is what makes us who we are. But at the same time, the information is what makes plants who they are, or even microbes, because all of them follow the same dynamics, that you have your information or genetic material encoded in your DNA that can be transformed into mRNA and be translated into proteins. And proteins are very important to conduct each one of those functions that we have. And it's all in this big cookbook of life. Mm -hmm.